a show that is perfect for 2017. Who cares if the news is real or fake, as long as it's shouted at you loudly enough? <laughs> we'll be cutting through the noise to keep you informed with our own brand of robust reporting and up-to-the-minute analysis. Let's go over to the MASH news desk for the latest headlines. Headlines on the hour. I get the mad cheddar cos my flow is next level, says Fiona Bruce. <laughs> And tablet computers under too much pressure to be thin. <laughs> and rail passengers to squeeze inside each other's bums. <laughs> but first, is Doctor Who too scary? Some die-hard Doctor Who fans have accused the show of going too far after it introduced its most terrifying creature yet, a woman. <laughs> Emma, why do some fans think women are unsuitable for a family audience? From the Daleks to the Weeping Angels, Who fans are used to scary aliens. But for some male devotees, their ultimate fear is the vagina. <laughs> Earlier, I spoke to Wayne Hayes, who runs the Gallifrey Base website and is a lifelong Doctor Who fan. Or Whovian, if you want to be anal about it. <laughs> well, Doctor Who, as you know, has a rich history of uh, frightening monsters. But when I saw a confident attractive woman <laughs> taking over the role of the doctor I was forced to hide behind my sofa for fear that she would somehow would come out of the uh, television and strike up a conversation <laughs> I understand some who fans also find the idea of a female doctor not only frightening but scientifically implausible Yes, but weirdly they were fine with episodes where the moon turned out to be a dragon egg, the queen was a werewolf, and some other bullshit about dinosaurs on a spaceship. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Boris Johnson's charm has officially run out. <laughs> That's the view of experts who found that the Secretary of State's amusing hair, archaic vocabulary and ability to look clumsy in almost all situations can no longer conceal his cold, careerist heart of ice. <laughs> Here's Nathan with more. As we all know, Boris has a harmless, plump physique and a voice like a 70s cartoon dog called Mr Trouser. <laughs> Surely that's enough to make us all like him. Earlier, I spoke to members of the famously easily led British public who confirmed that they, <laughs> stupid as they are, are no longer taken in. Well, Boris was on TV today, but suddenly, instead of a hilarious buffoon, all I saw was a, a strange middle-aged politician with a look of desperate ambition in his eyes. <laughs> and it was so disturbing, I had to turn over to country file and try to forget that I voted for Brexit because of that clearly fraudulent twat. <laughs> Of course, there is no speculation over whether Boris's complete lack of credibility may affect his position as one of Britain's most powerful men. Probably not, though. Back to you, Susan. <laughs> Nathan there, telling us what we already knew. <laughs> oh, come on. I mean, what about the time that Boris got his head stuck in a bin? That was brilliant. I don't recall that, Tom. Uh, there was a, a fish in the bin, and he went to grab it, and he got his head stuck, and then he had to run off with a bin on his head because he was being chased by Officer Dibble. <laughs> I think you're thinking of the old cartoon series, Top Cat, which is, of course, different to the news. <laughs> I know what I saw. <laughs> More news later. Thank you, News Desk. Yes, we're coming to you in the week that the BBC revealed the new Doctor Who will be Broadchurch actress Jodie Whittaker. A woman playing Doctor Who? What's next? A black James Bond? A gay Batman? An Asian comedian hosting a primetime TV comedy <laughs> show? <laughs> yes, that's right. And next, we're coming for all your jobs. <laughs> this is political correctness gone mad. <laughs> but the big story for me is Brexit. The elephant in every room. Brexit is happening, whether you voted for it or not. So the issue is now how the negotiations are progressing. On Monday, David Davis sat down with Michel Barnier, the EU's chief Brexit negotiator. Now, I've got a little tip for you, David. 
If you're involved in what you described as the most complicated negotiations of all time, maybe bring something to write with and maybe some <laughs> notes. <laughs> It doesn't exactly inspire confidence. You can imagine the negotiation starting with, do you have any demands? Yes, the UK is insistent I be given a spare piece of paper and one of those pens that has all the different colours in it. <laughs> Showing up with no notes, though, is confident. So Davis must be absolutely nailing it, right? The short answer is no. <laughs> the long answer is no! He opened negotiations on the back foot, having gone in insisting that there would be a parallel discussion on trade. On day one, the EU president insisted that would not happen, to which David Davis responded, Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that was the first day. That's like if I'd started this show by saying, Welcome to the MASH report. My name's Nish Kumar. This week's top story, I've shat myself. <laughs> Not all the decisions have been completely illogical. The civil service recruited negotiators who helped bring the Olympic Games to London, which is a complex international negotiation. Uh, the motto of the London Olympics was, of course, inspire a generation. But in retrospect, probably should have been, this is the last time any of you will be happy. <laughs> The negotiations have been further complicated by infighting within the Tory party between Remainers, people who want Brexit, and people who really want Brexit. <laughs> On Tuesday, Theresa May reminded her ministers of the folly of infighting, to which her ministers presumably responded, Oh! You're still here! <laughs> Tensions were also high at the annual Spectator Garden Party between Boris Johnson and David Davis and their respective representatives over allegations that Davis's people have been briefing against the Foreign Secretary. One of Johnson's allies is reported to have called for all briefings to stop or, and this is a genuine direct quote, I'll kick you in the bollocks. <laughs> to, to which Davis's ally replied, Well, I'll kick you in the bollocks. <laughs> Our country's future is in the hands of people who operate on a rhetorical level one notch below he who smelt it dealt it. <laughs> so, why is everyone fighting? It seems to be because no one really knows what Brexit means or what the long term consequences will be. And it really is starting to feel like we've not put our most talented people on the task. There's child of unimaginative naming magazines, parents of the decade, David Davis. <laughs> A man who, during his bid for the leadership of the Tory party, decided it would be a good idea to dress women in tight T-shirts saying, it's double D for me. <laughs> Just to clarify, his main selling point is, my name sounds like a boob size. <laughs> then you've got Theresa May, a woman whose most impressive achievement was being so ineffective that Jeremy Corbyn went from no hoper to possible prime minister to Glastonbury headliner. <laughs> And then there's Boris Johnson, a man with the vocabulary of a Victorian man and the political outlook of a Victorian man. <laughs> Only 22% of people are happy with how the government are handling Brexit. So, what is the solution? With public confidence in the toilet, we need something to turn this around. We need to think back to the last time we thought something was going to be a terrible disaster and a huge waste of money, but ended up being amazing. I'm, of course, talking about the 2012 Olympics. Therefore, the only logical step is to get Danny Boyle to artistically direct Brexit. <laughs> Shut it. I say, let's get the whole gang back together. Seb Co, wherever he is, <laughs> dust off that linen suit. Let's revive that weird flying Mary Poppins air squadron. And let's get Mo Farah to just run laps of Brussels just to intimidate everyone. <laughs> And while we're at it, let's replace David Davis and Boris Johnson with those weird penis mascots. <laughs> and listen, if the going gets really tough, let's have James Bond parachute in with the actual Queen. <laughs> you don't need a pen and paper when you've got 007 and Big Liz. <laughs>
Now, throughout the show, we'll have our social media editor, Rachel Paris, over there feeding us everything that you, the great British public, are saying about the MASH report and the stories we're covering. It's incredibly exciting because in a UK television first, we won't filter or censor your messages. Instead, we respect your freedom to offer bold, honest and sometimes challenging opinions. Rachel, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Nish. That's right. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> to do is tweet or Facebook us with the handle hashtag mash report and your thoughts your observations or analysis will come directly through to me myself now we're absolutely <laughs> we're so desperate for your communication so do please keep those coming so first up we've got Finners one from Blackpool has sent in a question he says do people actually watch this shit <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a question I think we're all asking ourselves. <laughs> and if any of you do know the answer to that question, please do get in touch with us. Uh, um, here's another one. This is from Spunky Donkey 666 <laughs> who says, Nish Kumar must have a fucking good agent. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he absolutely does, Spunky Donkey 666. He's a lovely man called Chris. He's very good at what he does. <laughs> Sorry, are there any serious ones? Oh, yes, absolutely, Nish. So here's one. Uh, Richie Lube has tweeted, really enjoying the show tonight. Great to finally see some proper news analysis in these turbulent and complex times. Oh, that's nice. That's it, actually nice. Isn't it? And here's a picture of my cock. Oh. <laughs> Is there anything about the news? Yes, absolutely. So, let's see. Um, this one is from Slippy Phil. People need to be more informed about diet. Obesity is harming quality of life. And Britons must be healthy for the coming race war. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing as important as our health, right, Nish? <laughs> well, this has been disappointing. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Back to you, Nish. Thank you, Rachel Paris. <laughs> Elsewhere in the news, Donald Trump has had a difficult week, and we literally could have said that every week since the 20th of January, <laughs> and it would have been true every time. Donald Trump's approval rating hit a record 70-year low of just 36%. And to put that in perspective, that is the RottenTomatoes.com approval rating of Too Fast, Too Furious. <laughs> With all the controversy, Trump has been forced to retreat to his traditional support base. Old ladies in Confederate flag bikinis and the Christian right. Last week, Trump was interviewed by televangelist Pat Robertson in a scene that looks like a cross between Frost Nixon and the last of the summer wine. <laughs> so why are American evangelicals supporting a man seemingly so antithetical to their Christian values? To shed more light on the Christian right's obsession with Trump, please welcome our religious affairs correspondent, Andrew Hunter-Murray! <laughs> Andrew, welcome. So, let's get down to it. Why is Donald Trump so big with American Christians? Uh, well, Nish, it's, it's fair to say that Trump has been promoting traditionally hot-button issues for the Christian right, things like abortion, women's reproductive rights, sex education, that kind of thing. And what's his stance on all of those? Uh, it's basically, none of those things affect me or my buddies in the slightest, so screw them. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but how can a religious group who prize modesty, helping others and fidelity really get behind Donald Trump? He might be the messiah. <laughs> I mean, you're going to have to explain that further. <laughs> Think about it. Christians don't love Donald Trump because he adheres to the teachings of Jesus. He obviously doesn't. They love him because they think he is Jesus. They worship him. Take a look at this gentleman. The Messiah will arrive, the end times will begin in the Jewish calendar year 5777. That's 2016 to 2017. Messiah will arrive. Now they're looking at Donald Trump. One of the rabbis illustrated how his name in the gematria, the numerology of his name, actually means Messiah. <laughs> Open and shut, Nish. <laughs> so... Is the Donald the Messiah? Uh, to find out a little more, I spoke to some genuine leading Christians to get their view. 
President Donald Trump once said the art of the deal was the second greatest book ever written after the Bible. He put the Bible first. It's that kind of humility which has led many to conclude that Donald Trump may be the new messiah. But is he? Without any definitive proof that Donald Trump is the prophet many evangelical Christians hope him to be, I went to speak to former MP, devoted Christian, and star of ITV's reality show Sugar Free Farm, Anne Whittacombe. <laughs> what about the, these very enthusiastic Trump supporters? At various rallies that Trump held, there were people with signs saying, Trump the Redeemer, uh, Trump is Christ. It's not a comb over, it's a halo. <laughs> These are not sentiments that would appeal to any serious Christian. We have one redeemer, one redeemer. But aren't there similarities between the two? No. There are no parallels whatsoever? No. Christ said, blessed are those who have not seen but still believe. He did. How different is that from Donald Trump saying, I will show you my tax returns at some point? There is nothing uniquely comparable to Christ in Donald Trump. One last thing. A lot of people have seen images of Christ. So. Mm -hmm. Some people have seen Donald Trump in butter. <laughs> oh, real, real, real. It seems Anne Widdicombe is unconvinced by Donald Trump's messianic qualities, so I went to see Paul Turp, the vicar at Shoreditch Parish Church. There are a lot of similarities, aren't there, between Christ and Donald Trump? The way that huge numbers of people came out in their thousands and thousands to vote for him and support him, and the way that the elite are really worried and scared and want nothing to do with him, um, that is a frightening parallel. Do you think that Jesus would have voted for Trump? I think undoubtedly. You think he would have voted for Trump? Absolutely. Do you think Christ would have brought back waterboarding? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus was very famous for laying his hands on people to heal them. Yeah. Donald Trump in the past has spoken about grabbing people by the pussy. Mm -hmm. Is it possible he was trying to heal them? I don't think Donald was doing that for their benefit. Are <laughs> <laughs> possibility that he's communicating? In political terms, huge chance. And in actual terms? In religious terms, yeah. um, very little chance. But a chance? I'm, s I'm saying there's a chance. Oh, right. <laughs> Garlanded by evangelical Christians, hailed by some as a prophet, there is every chance that Donald Trump may just be the next messiah, despite being a tax-dodging, pussy-grabbing, habitual liar who may not believe in God. main takeaway from that is Anne Widdicombe is looking good since Sugar Free Farms. Isn't she just? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew Hudson Murray! <laughs> Let's go back to the MASH news desk for the latest stories. Corbyn connects with young people by vandalising bus shelter. <laughs> Who are you? Ask wealthy parents as private schools begin summer holidays. <laughs> Trump thinks impeachment means really enjoying a peach. <laughs> but first, a 28-year-old man expects praise for not being a misogynist. <laughs> Roy Hobbs thinks his decision to treat women as equals warrants the kind of respect normally afforded top scientists or people who've donated their bone marrow. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm just sort of thoughtful sort of guy. When I watch pornography, I always make sure it's, it's you know, really nicely lit and it's uh, a <laughs> scene. Um, what else? I like Wonder Woman, abortions. And uh, I'm also reading a book by a woman at the moment, a long one as well, so I suppose you could say 
Well, I'm some sort of hero, really. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I am. You know. <laughs> Roy Hobbs there just doing his bit. <laughs> ITV's prediction that you like morons rutting on an island has proved depressingly accurate. <laughs> As reality series Love Island continues to captivate the nation, Emma met its producer to ask him why you like it and how he sleeps at night. Here I am on so-called Love Island, where a group of women with huge breasts and small, mean faces, plus a gang of necklace mouth breathers, are currently doing it in some sort of hut thing. I spoke to ITV executive Tom Booker, the visionary genius behind the show that has captured Britain's dark heart. Yeah, normally we dress this thing up as a kind of bold social experiment that's pushing the boundaries. No, not this time, no, it's just a bit better in the sun. Yeah, it's strong and simple, like our contestants. <laughs> so, Emma, do you know what's in store this week on Love Island? I can reveal there's more depressing fake emotion from knuckleheads who will shortly have a brief DJ career before getting arrested for trashing a Nando's. <laughs> Plus, the introduction of Dax, a super-hot horse who everyone will fancy. <laughs> Count me in. <laughs> we'll be back with more later. <laughs> so, as part of a push for greater diversity at the BBC, we've reached out to a conservative. So I'm very excited to introduce Jeff Norcott with a section we call Bursting the Bubble. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very kind. Thank you very, very kind. We've got any other Tories in? It's going to be a long four minutes. <laughs> Not only are you a Tory, Jeff, you're also a, a working-class Tory. That's right, that's right. I grew up in a council estate. My dad was a trade union man, so... You know, growing up, I was sort of like a political Billy Elliot. Do you know what I mean? I had to... Uh, it's very difficult for me. <laughs> I had to uh, hide the telegraph inside a copy of Razzle. It was tough. <laughs> Um, and what are you going to be covering for us on this week's Bursting the Bubble, Jeff? Today, Nish, I'm going to be telling you some harsh truths about NHS funding. OK. I'm going into this with an open mind. Okay, I heard you Liberals are capable of that. Um... <laughs> so, last week, the uh, Office for Budget Responsibility, they issued their fiscal risk report, which highlighted that health spending was the biggest threat to government economic plans. And would you agree, Nish, that the NHS is under pressure like never before? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's an inherent funding problem, isn't there? You put in money, you develop new uh, medicines, new uh, machinery, people live. Yeah. <laughs> it's a vicious circle. I... <laughs> OK, I would say that the NHS is uh, perhaps a victim of its own success. OK, well, fair enough. Do you, but do you do agree that there are people abusing free health care? Do you think that that's a fair shout? OK, there are people who maybe use the NHS when they don't need to. Yeah, I think I'll agree with okay, that. OK, fair yeah. And by people, let's say which people? Right. Old people. OK, I let's mean, wait. Well, hold on. <laughs> hold on, Jeff. Hold on, Jeff. Hold on, Jeff. <laughs> well, the elderly, Nish, I mean, they've just... They should be dead by now, but they're just... <laughs> they're just stringing it out and just hanging on in there, frankly, taking the piss. And... <laughs> I think what you need... I think you need an age where treatment stops, where you say, look, you've had a good go here, but I think that's... I think you're done now. And I've... <laughs> I've got an age in mind. I think we're all thinking it, so I'll say it. 80. I think you're done... <laughs> I think you're done when you're 80. Or will you want to stick around for another golden year in the day room watching Cash in the Attic? We... <laughs> we want your cash that's in the attic. That's... <laughs> that's the plan. I would describe that round of applause as concerning. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Come on, Jeff, you can't be serious. I know a lot of people think, but Jeff, I know particularly vigorous eight-year-olds, and I'm not a monster, so of course there should be an appeals process. Okay, well uh, that. <laughs> okay, that is better. Yeah. And by appeals process, I mean televised talent show. Right. So uh... it's, it's going to be called "How Do You Solve a Problem Like F All?" Right? Because they. <laughs> They, because the old dears, they love a sing-song, sure. don't they? So get them out, she comes out, sings, We'll meet again. Will we meet again, Ethel? Let's go with the public vote. Um... <laughs> Sorry, love. <laughs> Sorry, love, you haven't, you haven't made it. You're not going to London, but you might be going to Switzerland. So... Jeff. <laughs> Jeff. It's... It's... I like it. 
Je Jeff, I'm trying to keep an open mind, but you are losing me here, mate. Okay, look, let, let, let's come at this from another angle. I'll throw a stat at you. Okay. It's estimated that 30,000 people a day miss doctor's appointments, right? You've got to agree that's a, that's a problem, yeah, right? Yeah, that's, that's a problem. Yeah, and I, yeah, I'm not saying you should charge those people, but I do think if you miss free on the bounce, outside the doctor's surgery should be a photo of your face with the words chlamydia, question mark. <laughs> I do not have chlamydia, OK? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> oh, you throw it about a bit, but... Um... <laughs> Look, I mean, much as I wish it wasn't, that is factually untrue. <laughs> <laughs> Are you done? Well, I could tell you my views on foster care. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff, welcome! Thank you. Right, let's go over to Rachel Paris at the social media wall to see all the latest comment and analysis from the great British public to the stories we've been covering tonight. Rachel, what have the people been saying? Thanks, Nish. So, please do keep sending in your thoughts. We're incredibly grateful for any messages at all at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> So, this one comes in from Norman Legg. He asks, why does London television assume everything happens in London? I live in Gloucestershire and I've just seen two magpies fighting a badger. <laughs> Rachel, is there anything about any of the issues? Yes, absolutely, yes. OK, so this one's from Jimmy Thickbits. <laughs> mm. So, Jimmy writes, not all Brexiters are racist. I'm a racist and I voted Remain. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jimmy, for bringing a little bit of much-needed balance there. <laughs> uh, BBC Pay really capturing the imagination of the viewers, Nish. Jehovah's Bell comments, Personally, I hope Graham Norton enjoys his £850,000 salary. Oh, nice. That's a refreshing take on the whole thing. <laughs> because he will burn eternally for being a sodomist. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rachel Paris! <laughs> and we just have time for one last visit to the MASH news desk. Closing headlines. Tories to keep eating each other until there's just one big Tory left. <laughs> Flower was gagging for it, says B. <laughs> and Britain's reminded not to fax while driving. <laughs> but first, a middle class family is recovering after being forced to travel on a mega bus. <laughs> Emma has more on the story for us, Emma. Bill Mackay, a well-spoken man with his own office, travelled to London from Reading with his wife Lucy and three polite children to see some tasteful art at the Tate Modern. But what should have been a status-affirming day out turned into a smelly, low-budget nightmare. When train cancellations left the Waitrose-frequenting family with no option but to take a megabus. I took the last remaining seat next to the lavatories beside a gentleman who was very loudly playing music from his, his phone. The air was full of the sounds and smells of people devouring all sorts of different provisions. <laughs> a child was screaming and a woman two rows in front of me, weeping audibly. I, I uh, was a little concerned that my proximity to the WC would be a problem, but it was such a relatively short journey that I thought that nobody could have cause to defecate. How wrong I was. <laughs> At the end of their agonising two-hour journey, the Mackay family were airlifted to a sushi restaurant <laughs> and given an emergency harvest. They are expected to make a full recovery, although doctors believe Lucinda Mackay may write a book. <laughs> we'll be back with more later. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. Join us next week for more fake news, real news, and everything in between. Good night! Yeah!